Project showcases, technology, overviews, anything that you want to talk about. We want to keep the threshold super low so that anyone feels welcome to, to present. And if there's anyone who's kind of thinking about it, but not quite sure, just send me a message in Slack and I'm more than happy to help with like figuring out what to talk about, how to make the slides, how to prepare the talk. It, it should be something that anyone who has interest can get started with. But without further ado, I'm going to let Jan take over. We're going to spend the next 55 minutes or so talking about their improving. So go ahead, Jan. Cool, cool. So uh, hello, also from me. The Euro improving is our topic today. And I will start at the very beginning. Like, what is theory improving after all? Um, why should someone care? And then the more interesting part, how to actually do it. This will be part, like the first part of the presentation will be uh, with slides where I will explain the basics. But the whole rest of the session will be a li it will be a live coding. So um, to see a more hands-on approach. Um, if you have any questions or if something is unclear, please do interrupt me. I um, it's I don't I don't have the, the the chat open on a second monitor, uh, so just unmute yourself and interrupt me. Please do so. Okay. First, what is automated theory improving? Basically, you just let the computer do the proving for you, or at least let you help the computer prove for you. And automated theory improving was actually one of the major reasons why um, computer science was invented to get the, like, the big question at the beginning of the computer science field was, is it possible given enough resources to prove every statement, which sadly was very quickly refuted by Alan Turing and Alonzo Church. But uh, nonetheless, there are a lot of things we can prove using computers which is pretty nice. So it's basically use some checking or some assistant to prove whatever you want. Um, there are two flavors. Um, there are the fully automatic theorem provers called ATPs. You just basically just a black box program. You don't know how it works, but you give a goal, what you want to prove and a library of existing facts. So stuff that is already proved. Uh, and then it will do its magic and might come out with either as a yes i could prove this and maybe even this is how or it says sorry this is not provable or most of the time it says uh, sorry i've run out of time because reasoning is not something that's easy for machines obviously so the more commonly used uh, provers are the semi-automatic theorem provers which are usually called proof assistants so um there you develop your proof in a dialogue. So there's, there's the system, the program gives you like, what do you have to prove at this state? It can help you do simple steps by its own. So you don't have to do anything by yourself, but you are still in charge of doing the proof. Um, this is just basically a safety net and uh, like an assistant, assistant. And you can prove whatever you want. Uh, so for example, you could try to prove that after inserting into a binary search tree, it stays a binary search tree. And I think I will talk about this later more this particular example. So why why should we care at all? Um, the problem is that testing is not enough usually, even combined with coverage. Um, so even if you have 100% test coverage, you still get bugs. And that's because like, even like, unit tests can never show the presence or the, uh, can never show um, the absence of bugs. They can only show their presence because you can only test a finite subset of all the possible inputs, because usually most of your inputs are unconstrained. For example, if you have a function that takes a string, you already have infinitely many inputs that can this function can have, because their strings can be of arbitrary size. Um, so if we want to, or if we need to show that something is really working, testing is not enough. So there are basically three areas where you would apply theorem improving. The first one, obviously, is academics. So if you want to prove a theorem in a paper, you can do it by pen and paper proofs, but then you might make an, an error, forget some sign, whatever. It's easy to make errors. And also, usually, those proofs are a bit hand-wavy. For example, in programming language papers, they usually state, 
we use the variable convention that is established in this other paper, and thus this is works. Um, but there's no like you, you can't be sure that it really works for this for all the cases. There might be yeah, there's nothing that checks you your your proof for errors. Um, and even if you get to go through a peer review process, um, the other authors or reviewers won't might not catch those errors. Usually, this is not that huge of a problem because even there were errors found in very popular and important mathematical papers and um, publications. But um, they only made like they didn't invalidate the whole argument. It is usually thought of that if you and understand a problem good enough to write a paper and have like a proof, even if the proof has some errors, like the general idea still holds. It just might be some some details that are not true. Um, so that's the reason why our modern mathematics and modern whatever physics has not broken down yet because even if there are errors in some parts the gist still holds um the second field is if you have if you need high security or high confidence that your program does the right thing for example medical devices that should not kill their patients uh banks that don't want to lose a lot of money uh, of themselves or of their customers or anything similar so there like especially in banks i know uh, there are not Isabel, because Isabel is more uh, um, home in the academic side of things. But I know, for example, Idris is used uh, in banks um, to prove or get more guarantees. Like It's always what you prove that's interesting. And of course, the third uh, why you would do this is fun. My, some people like me have fun doing this. Um, I totally understand if that's not for everyone. There are basically four very popular proof assistants. They have different um, bases. So... Three of those, Cock, Idris, and Agda, are based on dependent types. And the one that I will talk about, Isabel, is based on higher order logic. So propositional logic is just and, or, not, and equality. And higher order logic is if you also have for all x something, or it exists an x such that. So this is higher order logic. And this is the core of Isabel. Um, to understand, so I, I thought no one should have any knowledge of proofs before this talk. So I need, like, how can we actually prove stuff? Um, and the most important way to prove anything is induction, which is basically like recursion, but for proofs. So assuming we want to show something for every natural number, instead of like iterating, like for testing, we would say, okay, it holds for one, it holds for five, it holds for seven and also for 10. But instead of doing that for all possible natural number, which are there infinite, infinitely many, we do two things. So first we show that it holds for zero. This is basically a unit test. Something I want to show works for the number zero. And then the second part, which is like the core of the proof is we assume that the fact was already proven for n. And now with that knowledge, we need to show that it also holds for n plus one. Because then with those two, we can combine, like, for example, if you want to show it for one, logically it's just showing it for zero. And then we know it works for zero. We show it for zero plus one equals one. So, and with that, we can, in theory, get any er, any number we want. Um, so we can show this in, in, in general. Written with a more mathematical notation, it would look like this. Um, this pretty much only means that the, the line is, is the implication. So everything above the line, we need to know, and then we can conclude just with those above the line, the one below the line. So if we know that our property holds for zero and assuming our property holds for N, we can conclude that our property holds for N plus one. We can in general conclude our property holds for any N. This is basically the core of any constructive proof. Um, there are also other proofs. Um, so every proof in Cock, Idris, and Acta will work like this, pretty much. In Isabel, you can also go in the other way and basically assume that not our property holds and then show false, so show a contradiction, and then our property has to hold. But I don't really like those kind of proofs, so we, fo we will focus on induction today. So how, how does natural numbers actually look like in Isabel? Numbers are just a normal data type with two options. So it's a sum type. So either it is a zero or it's a successor of another natural number. So you see 
we can define ourselves zero to be this zero and one to be the successor of zero and two to be the successor of the successor of zero and so on. So the numbers are just definitions. This data type already makes it possible to uh, state or say any number that we want. And this also means if we go back to this section, it's not actually n plus one, it's given n, we show it for the successor of n because this is where the recursion comes from. We assume it for this, and now we want to show it for the whole thing. That's how the, recur the, the induction works in Isabel. Um, I wish I was, we will see how it works in, in practice later. So example time. Let's go it first just through it in the head. There's this little story that um, Gauss, who is a famous mathematician, uh, was in school and the teacher wanted to have some some space for him, just some quiet time. So he told the class, so please sum up the numbers from 1 to 100, uh, thinking that this would take them a while and he could do something else and have some quiet time for himself. Um, but like 15 minutes later, Gauss came with the answer, um, which was totally unexpected by the teacher because they had like to do 100 summations. And Gauss did something quite clever. So first, if you look at this, like this is what the, the, the children do. Like 1 plus 2 is 3, plus 3 is 6, plus 4 is then 10, and so on and so on. This this takes some time. Gauss did it a little bit different. First, he grouped the numbers a bit differently. Addition is commutative. We can swap around the numbers however we want. And it's also associative, so we can uh, add parentheses wherever we want. So he just took the last of those numbers and put it in front and then the second after the two and the third after the three so we get these pairings and you can probably also see that this is always the same number and it's 50 times because we always combined two numbers to get those so this is quite clever because now you only need to calculate 101 times 50 and you're done don't need any summations just some multiplications of course, we can also generalize this. I already said here we want to count from 1 to n, whatever n we want. And it basically works the same. So we say we want this is, for example, this is the summation symbol. It just means sum from this to this. So it's to write this, we would write the summation symbol from 1 to 100 would be exactly this. And you can also see like the n, the maximum is one more. So it's n plus 1 and we have it n plus divided by two times, because we always combine two numbers. So in the end, we get n plus 1, n and a half times. So this is the general formula that Gauss came up with in this class uh, to, cake, to sum up the numbers. So we would like to prove this fact now in Isabel. So let's do this. So this is Isabel. I made the font size quite big. I hope you can everyone can read it. Because we are doing some math stuff, our file is not called file, but it's called a theory. It doesn't matter. Uh, this is just the name of the file. We can import other theories or other files. Um, main is basically the standard library. It contains stuff like the natural numbers, lists, sets, and all the stuff you would normally want to use uh, when proving or when writing code. Um, there's also complex main, which includes complex numbers, but we only will care about natural numbers in this tutorial. So, and here will go our code. So, for example, we can, with, val with the value command, we can use Isabel as a calculator. So, 1 plus 4, we just need to say what numbers we want, because numbers might be uh, natural numbers or complex numbers or whatever. So, this is why I add a type signature here. And here in the output, so this is the output window, we, the, the state, it says five, pretty much expected. So let's prove what we want to prove. Proofs are started with the keyword lemma, which is just, an, there's also theorem and, the, but they are basically doing the same. It's just how mathematicians call their, uh, their, their facts. So then we can add a name. So we will say, let's say some goes. And now what do we want to prove? So we want to prove the sum from one to n, and that will be natural numbers, equals to n times n plus one divided by two. That will be what we want to prove. And especially this is exactly what we have here. So n plus one times n, so I just have put it n beforehand, but it doesn't matter, 
divided by two. So let's get back to wherever my, there it is. So usually we want to prove by induction. So let's apply induction. So now the system needs to know what should we induct on. In our case, it's pretty simple because there's only one variable, only one thing that we can actually, and everything else is constant, so there's nothing to induct on. So we will induct on n. And you see here in the output window, we get now two sub goals. The first one, every n is replaced by zero. So the set from one to zero, which is the empty set, and then zero times zero plus one divided by two. Like this is trivial. You can just like, this will be zero, and this, because we zero times something is also zero, we just need to like calculate it out. So this is where we can just apply simp, which stands for simplification. So just evaluate the stuff and it should work. Here, the second sub goal we have, so here we see the set two sub goals. Now with simplification, we solve the first sub goal and only the second sub goal is left. We see before this implication error. So everything before implication we already know or assume and the thing after the error we want to prove so we know that our thing works for n and we want to show it now for the successor of n um, and i can also spoil this for you we can the system is clever enough to see that for itself so if we write done we have proven now this and also auto is a bit special because normally those applies only work on a single sub goal but auto works on multiple sub goals so we don't even need this one so just apply induction apply auto and we are done we can also abbreviate this a bit by saying by induction auto same thing just a bit terser but the thing is now we don't really see how the proof works we have to trust isabel that it's correct um, there's also a second way. So what we saw here, this is called an apply script because it's basically like the assembly language of proving. So you just apply a tactic and apply a tactic and at some point you're done. It's terse, but it's also not quite readable. And for this uh, matter, there is a second way to do proofs in Isabel. And this is also, this, this is one thing I really like about Isabel and which also is unique to Isabel, uh, which are structured proofs. So again, we say, but we need a new name because we already have some goals. And again, we want to prove the same thing. But now we say, yeah, it, it tells us, hey, you can already solve this with dilemma above, but we will ignore this. We will prove this anew. So, we will write the proof keyword, and again, we want to prove by induction on n. And in the output, you see the same two goals generated, but you also see this thing you can just click on, and it will generate you this proof. So now we have two cases, so the case 0 and the case successor of n. Um, the case 0, you can see here, this will be replaced with the goal. So everything with a question mark is uh, basically like a, a, a short shorthand and question mark case is the shorthand for like, what do you want to prove? It's the same thing as the goal here. Um, again, this is trivial because we just need to evaluate the stuff. So again, simplification already solves us. The more interesting part is now here. You see here, in this definition, we had everything in, in one goal. So we had our assumption and our goal. Here it's now a bit different. Like this case statement gives us now the assumption and here this only gives us the goal. Um, this then allows us to take the assumption and make it available here. So here we see we know it works for n. We want to show it for n plus one. So let's do this. We can have intermediate facts with half, just like you would in a mathematical paper, half something. So we want to show that if we just go back here, we want to show that this part, we want to simplify that part. So, and we want to show, now we want to yeah work on that. Um, the first thing I will do 
is basically uh, basically for every for this induction proof we want we need to get the the successor part divided up from the rest. We want at one point to have this form, and this is where we want to go to. So one part, which is easy, we can just get rid of this successor by because successor n times n plus one times the content is the same as n times uh, the content plus the content. And now we need to put everything in parentheses and divide it by two. Again, now we have to show that it's valid, but this is simple math. This can be done by simplification. Now we can continue. Also have, this also makes us able to use this dot, dot, dot syntax, which just basically copies the right-hand side of the goal above. So if we just, this won't be correct, but it will, so you see here, this is the right-hand side of the one above. It just saves us some typing. So now we can continue and we also want to get rid of the successor in here. So we have n times, that, that's fine. But how can we get the successor of n out of there? Well, we have n times this thing. So if we remove the pl plus one in there, we need to add an additional n things because basically this is the same as saying n plus one plus one. You see in here, it still works. It's still not highlighted in red. Um, and if we have n times this one, we just have n. So that's where this comes from. And now we need to can do the same at the and here just n plus one plus one. And again, we divide by two. And this is also true. Sim no, this is not true. I made a mistake somewhere. Um, n times, let me check. Oh yeah, it's not, it's obviously plus. We, we take n times one out here and we add. Now this works. So, now we can do some simple restructuring. We can say the first part we leave unchanged. And now we just have two times n plus one and all of that divided by two. It's just I'm taking these two n's and these two ones and just adding a parenthesis there. there. Again, simple math the system can prove it by itself. So we can continue. N times, I will again copy this. What I want to do now is I'm, I want to uh, this two and this divided by two, these cancel out. So I can move this, I can move this uh, inwards and then have plus N plus one outside. Mm, oh yeah, I want, should add two. So just, I have a plus here. I have this two canceled out this two. So the plus stays and the twos have canceled out. And so that, that's just copied over. I made no mistake. The system still accepts it. So what we can see now, if we look again at what we already know, we know that n times n plus 1 divided by 2. So exactly the thing that's here is equal to the sum from 1 to n. So in the next step, we will use that information. And this is where the induction comes into play. So this part, I can just copy from our proof state. I can copy that part, paste it in here, plus n plus 1. So if I try to do to, yeah. If I try now to prove this, the system will error out. It says fail to finish proof because we need that info. That info is here. So I can say using sac.ih. IH stands for induction hypothesis. So 
this is basically the information. I can also, this is part is optional, just saying, so this will also work. I just like to say, this is the induction hypothesis. So as, as remember, we, we assumed it already works for all n. So we can use this assumption. Here we use our assumption to replace this part with this part. Note that we haven't changed anything mathematically. We just, we, we know already this is equal to this sum. So we can use that fact. And again, that's now accepted. So the final step we all only have to do now is if we have the sum from one to n plus n plus one, this is obviously the same as just saying the sum from n to n plus two plus one. And this is again simple math. Is this clear? So if you sum up from one to n and add n plus one, we can also directly write it's the sum from one to n. So what did we want to show actually? We wanted to show that the sum from one to the successor of n is the thing we started with. So we have actually proven the thing. So we only need to replace this then by finally to make this whole Finally, we'll basically take the first left-hand side and the last right-hand side and make them available. You see here, this is the first left-hand side up there, and this is the last right-hand side, so here. We have this equality now available to us. And you can see here, it's basically the same thing as we want to prove. It's just like flip the equality and replace this plus one by successor for one. Again, this is very trivial, so the system can do it by itself. And now we have a proof that is understandable if you know the syntax of Isabel. So you can see here at any point, you can click with the mouse and see what is the current state. And even if you don't want to click at the state, we can just say, okay, the case zero appears to be trivial. And for the other case, we have here a chain of equalities where we transform the original form to the other form and thus prove what we wanted to prove. For such a simple case, you would usually do something like this because you don't really care why it works, it just works. Um, so if usually I, when, when it, the, the solution is just induction auto, I just leave it at that. But for, for more complicated goals, I usually do a full-fledged ESA proof. So this language here is called ESA, like the river here in Munich, just to make it, to, to follow the proof in your head more easily. At that point, oh, we'll break. Is this clear, this example? Are there questions, anything? Okay, I guess not. So let's continue with more programming stuff. As you saw, natural numbers are just a simple data type. So induction also works on data types. Um, in fact, that's how it's implemented in Isabel. And for example, it works on lists. So let's write a simple function that will sum up everything in a list. So we have two cases to consider. First, the empty list is zero. The second case is if we have an X followed by some other list. And this is simply X plus the sum of the rest. Um, you also see here, down here, found termination order. Um, this is because in every theorem prover, functions have to terminate and you have to prove that it terminates. In Isabel, if you use the fun keyword, um, this is done for you. So the system will try to automatically find a termination order. For more complicated functions, you might have to prove this yourself, that it really does terminate. Um, the reason for this is quite simple, actually. If we go in a comment, I can show you. Um, like functions can be used in proofs. So if you have now a recursive definition like this, that does not terminate, what can we do with this? Um, let's do some simple high school math. We say, okay, on either side of this equation, let's subtract f of x. What we get then, is zero equals one, which is not the thing you would want to prove in a theorem prover. Um, and this would is also like valid in general. So this is the reason why they have to terminate. 
in our case, it's tri it's easy for the system to see because the the um, the argument to our the recursive call always gets smaller. Like here, we always make the list smaller, so we can't go in an endless loop. So that's also the heuristic that they that the automatic uh, termination prover uses. So if something gets smaller on every recursive call, that's fine. Um, but those of you that are more that are versed in functional programming might see a problem with this definition. Can anyone tell me? Okay. Um, it's not tail recursive, which means it's not the most efficient thing to do. Um, the reason why this is we do first we do recursion and then we add. Ideally, recursion would be the last thing we do. So let's write a tail recursive uh, version. Um, this version will take another argument and again we have two cases now with this n here and an empty list is the n and a non-empty list is now we do the recursion directly and after the recursion we add those two and pass the last and i did somewhere i did a mistake ah yeah um it's called some list tail now it works again our recursive call always gets smaller, so we terminate. The reason why for proofs we usually want to prefer that line is, I can show you, so one thing we want to, might want to do is prove that they do the same thing. So we assume some list, so not we assume, we try to prove some list of some list is the same as this. Try to prove this now. Again, we have only one variable, so there's only one thing to induct on. So let's do this. Apply induction access. So now again, we get two sub goals. The first thing is we try to prove it for the empty list. And then assuming it already works for some list, we try to prove it for the concatenation of this one element with that list. So just like in the NAT case, where it had it already proven for n and tried to prove it for the successor of n, basically the same thing. We know it for some list, and now we want to prove it for one element added to that list. Again, we saw earlier that auto seems to do quite fine, so let's apply auto. But this time it didn't work. Um, why? So it was able to solve this first sub-goal because that sub-goal is easy. It can just evaluate them. But the second sub-goal really, it's almost the same. So it's it did convert this into the definition here. So it says it's A plus this thing. So it just took this definition and it took this definition, but it's it can't solve it. Um, and this is also like where those quirks I mentioned earlier come into play. Um, you just, you won't be able to, to prove this, um, even though it's perfectly fine. We have to do it a bit different. So we abort our current proof with oops, do something slightly different. Um, I can tell you what the problem is. The problem is this zero. Um, the system can't, so if something is constant, Visible will not replace it with a variable. And only variables can change in those steps. Um, but you see here, we need those to change because like, we are adding it. It will be different after the recursion. So we need to get rid of that zero. So we generalize our statement with a bit different. Some list access equals some list oops that should be an equal sign some list tail so now we need a variable here so it can change but
But now this is not true. We can, for example, do this quick check and we'll try to run it through a few test cases. And it already tells you, hey, I found a counter example. So if you take the empty less than n equals one, then the left-hand side is zero and the right-hand side is one. Um, so this statement is not true anymore because now this is not zero anymore. But we can fix this by just adding the n on the other side. If we now run quick check, it didn't found any counter example. Um, yeah, so this is now a more general definition. Now we can try again. We, we could now also induct on n, but our function does not pattern match on n. So it's not useful. In general, you want to induct on the thing where you pattern match. So we apply induction on the list again. We get the same two goals. And if we now apply, up, apply auto, um, it still can't solve it. Why? I think like, why, why can't it solve them? Um, the reason is, again, this changing n. If you, this is more really specific. I was just want to show you, it's not that easy um, to, to get even stuff that looks pretty trivial can be more complicated with Isabel or any proof assistant. You would have the same problems than any other proof assistant. The thing is, you see here, this is for all. So it says for all A and for all XS, but it does not say for all N. So this thing is somehow stuck. We need to put th this in here. And we can do so by saying arbitrary n. So as you can see now, the n moved in here and also in here. And that's the thing that we want. But this allows us to have a different n here and here because the recursive call will have a different n. So this will be different than this. So this is why we need this arbitrary. If you now do auto, it can't solve it, but if you now try everything, no, I did some other mistake again. Let me check my, there, I, can you show you something else? It still can't solve it by its own, but this is all another nice feature of Isabel. We have this tab down here, sledgehammer. Uh, sledgehammer is like the brutal method of trying stuff. So you saw earlier those automated uh, automated theorem provers. Um, Isabel can call them. You see them here, CVC3, set 3 and so on. Those are all theorem provers that work automatically. And if we try, so if we use, you know, I just heard a question or something. <laughs> Remote vampire. Yes, um, vampire, yeah, it's just vamp all of those are open source. Uh, but Vampire has another license, so it, it can't, those are included with Isabel and you need to allow this as a non-free license. So this is why it's called Remote Vampire. But yeah, Vampire is another theorem prover. Um, from my experience, depending on your task, different theorem provers will have different answers. But Isabel will just simply call all of them. So let's do this. We just hit apply and immediately we found a proof. And then it gives you what it should be. And you see here, metis is another method like auto and add dot commute and left commute. So it just needs some fact about how to turn around or so we can try and see here's also how long those methods took. Um, and you see also very also for simple stuff, some theorem provers might not have an answer. And um, so it's really good that Isabel tries all of them. Um, to my knowledge, this is also exclusive to Isabel, this feature, but I'm not sure about that one. Um, so let's just take the one that takes the less time, hit it, and you see we have now proven this thing because nothing is read. By already always terminates the proof. So if you think something should be working, you can try induct, uh, you can try um, is a, a sledgehammer. But if you go, for example, back here, try sledgehammer on this definition, it will run, it will still run, it is still running, and I want, don't want to spare too much time on this, but now we will see uh, here uh, timeouts for all the theorem provers, um, because they couldn't prove it. So I will just interrupt this. So sledgehammer can't do the work for us, only if we think it should really be able to find a proof, 
then we can use it. But now we didn't, we, we wanted to prove this fact, but we have only proved this fact. So now we can go back and try to actually prove the thing we wanted. And this is now pretty easy. We can, using our, our fact, so if we go back here to the output, so we see if we know this, we know this, and we can also do now the proof manually because this is a very easy example. We just need to fix basically this variable and we can say what we should want variables built off. So the first one we will ignore and the second we will set to zero. And you can see here, the second variable is now, so if you go here, uh, okay, now I need to delete it. Here, there is the variable, so off allows us basically in order of appearance to set values for those or ignore them with an underscore. So if I put it back, we ignore the access with the underscore and the n we set to zero. So now we want to prove that some list plus zero is the same as that thing. That's pretty trivial. So just simplification will work. And now we have proven the thing we wanted to prove, but we couldn't prove it directly. We had to first generalize make it into a variable and then again make it more specific. So it sounds counterintuitive, but the more general lemma is usually easier to prove than the more specific lemma. It's just something one gets used to. So one last example, and I also already talked about this. So we can define data types with the data type keyword and we want to define a tree data type. So it's either a leaf or a node that contains a left tree, a value, and a right tree. Isabel is a bit weird, so all, everything with tick A is a variable, a type variable, and instead of parentheses, like any sane language, use string as a quotes. Um, that's just weird Isabel syntax. Um, again, we would like to tr prove something using induction, but we can, What what is the induction principle for this? Um, we can look at that with the theorem keyword. We can take a look at any definition. So if you just type tree.induct, we see here, okay, we need to prove it for the leaf. And then assuming it already works for the left part and assuming it works for the right part, we need to prove it for the node. And then we can, it already, it works for every, any tree. If you, in contrast, if you look at nuts.induct, this is the same thing I showed you in the, in the, in the presentation. So assuming it works for zero and, uh, no, if you can prove it for zero and assuming it works for any natural number, we can prove it for the successor. We can prove it, our statement works for any natural number. So you see here, we have two induction hypotheses. Here we only have one. So what do we want to prove? I already told you earlier that we want to prove something about binary search trees. So first we need to define what is a binary search tree. So a binary search tree, we need something that has a comparison operator. And we just say, is this tree a binary search tree? So the first case, any leaf is always a binary search tree. Um, we see here now we need the second pattern. So the second case is more interesting. So what makes a binary search tree a binary search tree? In a binary search tree, every element to the left is smaller and every element to the right is bigger than the value. So let's just encode this. So for all x in, the set L, so on, on the left, we want this X to be smaller than the value. And we want for all the X in the set of the right side, we want that X to be bigger than our value. This is not enough. Ah, um, weird precedence for Isabel. We need another pair of parentheses out here. This is not enough because now we need to also verify this works for like the, the subtrees also need to be binary search trees. 
So we need to assert that and we require that the left side is a search tree and we require that the right side is a binary search tree. And this is now basically saying, when is a tree a binary search tree? If we now write an insert function, um, for time reasons, I will just copy it instead of typing it out. So again, we take an element with a comparison operator, a tree and return a new tree. So inserting into a leaf is pretty easy. We just make a new node with that value. Inserting into a node, we have three cases. First, the inserted value is less than our value. So we insert it into the left tree. Otherwise, it's bigger than our value, so we insert it in the right tree. If it is equal, it's already in there, we just return the original node unchanged. So in the presentations, I've already told you what we want to prove. We want to prove that inserting into a binary search tree stays a binary search tree. And again, as always, we have two, like we have, we do have two variables, but the one we pattern match on is the tree. So it makes sense to induct on that. So induction T. And we can again use this neat proof outline to generate a bit of code for us. Let's name those a bit more nicely. So we now we see here we get two hy induction hypotheses. So assuming the left is a subtree, it is a binary search tree, we know that inserting will stay a binary search tree and the same for the right. And we know that our node in itself is a binary search tree. What we should prove now is that inserting in that node is a binary search tree. So um, the base case for leaf is pretty easy. So just just evaluate and be done with it. Uh, by the way, the sorry can be used to abort a proof, but assume it's true. We can do this now. So I can spoil already. If we apply auto, it will not finish the proof. You see, there's still two sub goals and they are more complicated and I don't really want to read that one. The thing is what you will also get used to if you do some more theorem proving in this output, you will spot patterns. And one of this pattern you see here, it can't, so it wants to have an element out of all the elements in the right subtree with the X inserted. It can't really, it doesn't know what will be here. So we need to help the system a little bit. So by adding the fact that, that the set of inserting into a tree doesn't have to be a binary search tree is the same as the tree, the set of the elements in the tree union that one X. And because this is always like the right hand side is always simpler as the left hand side. We can also say, please use this in general to simplify. Um, so we can say this lemma should be used in, in down here to simplify our stuff. We can assume first it's true by writing sorry. If you now check here, auto worked. So this is because we said here, please use it for simplification. If we don't use it, auto will not finish, but we can say using BST set, that's the name of the, no, it's insert set. Apply auto, no, okay, so it will, it needs them. We can add them also here. Same thing, it finishes. Um, but now, okay, we know, if we know this, we can prove this. So let's prove this now. Um, this is where the sorry keyword comes in. Oops, uh, makes this not being defined. Sorry assumes it's true. Um, again, we have only one variable we can induct on. That makes sense because we pattern match on it. So let's apply induction on this T. And let's try auto. And indeed that works. So we are done with this proof and we are done with this proof. Um, so you see, this is a more involved example, but the proof, it can also make this way easier by just saying by induction T auto. And of course we need that helping lemma again. Same thing. 
So we can prove some properties easy if we add some additional facts for the system to know about. There are more, I have some more examples, but that would take too long now. I'm, uh, I'm out of time. Um, but if you're interested, I can yeah, show you those examples too. So I just wanted to, to, to show you. It is easy to let the system do everything for you. Um, you can do it by yourself manually. You can, this is a normal functional programming language, and you can also extract that code and export it as Haskell or OCaml, or I think on other languages. So you can use this in a normal product. So the code you have written in Isabel, you can use it also in your production code. Usually writing a more performant version is not the thing that is easier to prove. So you see here, we had to jump to th through some hoops to get there. You can have multiple induction hypotheses here. And sometimes you need extra information for the system. You need to help this system with some extra facts to find the solution. That's all from my side. Uh, I thank you for your attention. I hope I didn't overall or <laughs> you with too much knowledge or too much information. Uh, I would have some other, some time for questions if you have any. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Jan. That was really interesting. It brought back some memories from university. Bad classes. <laughs> I hope not bad memories. Some of them better than others. <laughs> Do we have any questions or comments from, from anybody? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. For my question is, if you would want to learn more about Isabel, how you would start? There are two, like, there are two courses at my university um, that teach Isabel or use Isabel in their teachings. And both of them have a book attached to them, uh, which is basically the content of the course in book form. And half of each course or the first half of each course is introduction to Isabel. Um, so let me get you the link. I have it here. So one course is functional data structures and the other is concrete semantics. Uh, but the first part of the course should be pretty much the same. So here's a re GitHub repository. Um, and there is, first there are some exercises and there's also this, this procproof.pdf. And that's basically how, to, how Isabel works and like everything you need, would need to know about Isabel. There's also another PDF in there, um, book FDS, which is about data, uh, which is not complete yet, but it's about the data structures. Or for example, here you can see in the uh, table of contents, page 29 talks about binary search trees. So there's some so some part of this. So there, there are binary search trees, red, black trees on more complicated data structures that are proven with some, um, so some properties are proven uh, with Isabel. So that's what I had this semester, which was a pretty nice course and all the materials again are in this repo. Great, anyone else? I think you can also ask in Slack if something pops up later, ah, if you're still more? kind of processing the things. Yeah, one more, yeah, I'm available in Slack. And also the lectures, I think they can be viewed without logging in. So on this page, there are the lectures of that course, if you are really interested. Um, so the recordings of the lecture are available there. But yeah, the book is basically the same content as the lectures. Cool, cool.